All right. Today is Tuesday, October 26. This is a recap for the stock market activities today. We continue to get more earnings from companies, and the theme remains the same. Inflation is eating away margins, and therefore companies across the board are resorting to jacking up prices higher for us, the end consumer. This ripple effect in the economy when you have inflation squeezing margins leading to companies to increase prices across the board, this ripple effect goes beyond the control of the Fed. So we have a delusional madman, an egomaniac in Jerome Powell, the chairman of the Fed, who continues to insist that inflation will be transitory, it's going to go away, we have to wait till next year, and everything is going to be resolved. But these price increases are permanent, specifically if the consumer responds to the price increases positively. And for now, with consumer confidence remaining at elevated levels, as the impact from stimmies, stock market gains, crypto market gains, real estate market gains, everybody's net worth is moving higher. And therefore, Therefore, we have high consumer confidence, and the consumer for now is responding positively to the price increases from companies. And therefore, this will lead to a super cycle in inflation. When demand continues to surge higher, the supply needs to meet up with the demand. For the supply to meet up with the demand, companies will have to ramp up production of goods and services. To ramp up the production of goods and services, they need workers. We have a massive labor shortage. To alleviate the labor shortage, they're going to have to pay more in wages. And therefore, we have this inflation spiraling out of control. What is the Fed and the federal government's response? Oh, it's going to get better. Just wait, buckle up, and everything will be fine. At this point, do you have any confidence that these fools will be able to handle the economic crisis of inflation? Of course not. Now, our job as market participants is to look at these earnings and figure out the companies with the pricing power. What does that mean, by the way, the pricing power? It doesn't mean just companies hiking up prices higher. It also means that the consumer for these companies will respond positively to the increase in prices. And therefore, we have to dig for the details in every earnings report from every major company to find out the companies with the pricing power and the consumer with the ability to respond positively to these price hikes. Another thing to think about is, we have a stock market that is addicted to coke, addicted to the generosity and the accommodation from the Fed. And we know that this generosity and accommodation is about to go away as the Fed prepares for taper. And after taper, of course, if inflation doesn't respond and continues to rise higher and higher and higher, as we are expecting, by the way, then the next step by the Fed will be jacking up interest rates higher, perhaps abruptly, without an advance warning. This will, of course, impact the market negatively. And by the way, at this point, the market is so addicted to the coke from the Fed that it already developed a tolerance to the coke. And now it needs more. It needs not just coke, but it needs fentanyl from the Fed. We're not going to have that. We're going to have monetary tightening ahead of us. And therefore, we need to look for the cleanest companies out there. Good margins, good growth, commanding pricing power, and most importantly, decent valuations. Because overvalued companies will be hurt the most as the Fed removes the so-called accommodations away from the market. So let's start already with the earnings, and here we go. In focus tonight, what else? We're going to go over earnings from the companies that we got today before and after the bill. Before the bill, we got earnings from UPS and 3M. And after the bell, we got earnings from Visa, Microsoft, and Alphabet. Let's start with UPS. Now, UPS is one of those names for old subscribers who remember. One of those names that I have in my inflationary stocks list. We used to track this name pretty much every single day. The problem last time around with the stock, the earnings for the stock, is the fact that we had the reopening and consumers were shopping outside. They were nostalgic to the malls and shopping in person, and therefore the freight revenues for UPS went down significantly. This quarter, however, sales rebounded across the board for the company. One of the reasons that we contribute for the rise in sales and the numbers, the decent numbers from UPS, is the fact that we had the Delta impact. A lot of people went back to lockdown mode with online shopping, and of course, the rise in online shopping is reflecting positively 
in the earnings of UPS. And you're seeing that with the earnings of Visa, by the way. Now, that doesn't mean that at some point when we move away from this lockdown environment and the variant after variant after variant, we're going to move away from all of this at some point. Will that impact UPS negatively? The answer, perhaps not, because the company commands a massive pricing power. And for now, there is no alternative. Let's look at the numbers right away. To begin with, the company raised their dividend, and this is of course a rarity in this market. We don't have a lot of companies with the ability, with the cash positioning to increase their dividends quarter after quarter. But this is the story of UPS. They have the cash, they have the positioning, and they have the pricing power to continue to issue dividends and jack that dividend higher and higher and higher. Now, when we look at the numbers, for example, the average revenue per piece, this is an important metric in the shipping industry. We will look at the domestic packages, for example. The revenue was up 8.8% year over year, and for exports, the revenue per package was 15.8% year over year. This is the rate of growth, of course. All in all, for the international package segment, the revenue growth was 14% year over year. When we look at the domestic package, for example, the total revenue growth year over year was about 9.2%. And then when we look at the operating profit, this is an important margin metric, the operating profits were up 23.4% year over year. When we look at the income statement, for example, revenues were up 14 and a half percent year over year. What about expenses? We're looking for the rate of revenue to increase at a faster pace than the increase in the rate of expenses. For compensation and benefits, the rate was 4.4 percent increase year over year. For fuel, an important segment here, we are trying to find out the impact of the rise in energy prices on co corporate earnings. Here's an example. Fuel costs went higher by 83 percent year over year. All in all, the operating expenses were up 10 and a half percent year over year revenues were up 14 and a half percent year over year expenses were up 10 and a half percent year over year the rate of revenue the rate of growth in revenue is exceeding the rate of growth in expenses and therefore the company is doing fine with the operating profits coming out at 47 percent year over year and the net income a stunning 51 percent year over year with this kind of growth and this kind of pricing power, these are the kind of companies that you want to stick with in face of this massive inflation. What other company can stand the rise in fuel costs? Can restaurants do that? Perhaps. Do they have the commanding the pricing power? Can they command the pricing power? I should say. Some could. Others will not be able to do so. But here we have a company that is fully capable of raising prices and commanding a massive margin advantage. And of course, right away, they know that the rise in inflation of fuel costs and labor costs will continue to surge higher and higher and higher. And there is no guarantee here that the rate of growth and revenues will continue to increase higher and higher and higher. So what do you do in this inflationary environment? The answer is they're going to jack prices higher. Here we have another company. UPS just posted record-breaking profits, and they plan to hike prices in 2022. You hear that, Mr. Pound? We have company after company after company. Pretty much every single earning that we have, every single report that we have, companies are saying we're going to jack up prices higher. Is the chairman of the Federal Reserve even aware of what's going on right now? Or is he in complete delusion, an egomaniac who is obsessed with being right rather than doing the right thing? Next, we have another consumer staple giant, 3M. And here is the earnings report that we got in the morning. We're looking for margins, of course, year over year. And how is that standing against the rate of growth? In expenses. When we look at the different segments of the business for safety and industrial, the rate of growth year over year is down to 19.2%. It was 25.7% last year. This is, of course, is understandable. Last year, we had the height of the pandemic. There was a shortage in masks and safety equip equipment, and therefore, 3M commanded a massive pricing advantage. Realistically speaking, we're not going to have the same pricing advantage this year. However, hold your horses here before you get too excited because they're going to jack up prices higher again due to inflation. But here is another important segment for the business, transportation and electronics. The margins were up 19% year over year. This is down from 22.2% last year. Another segment that is getting shot in margins. So what is holding the business right now? It is healthcare. The margins continue to explode higher here to 23.5% year over year versus last year 22.8% year over year. 
Lastly, what about the consumer segment? We have 21.7% growth year over year this quarter, excuse me, last quarter, versus a rate of growth of 24.3% year over year last year. So all in all, the operating margins are shrinking from last year. Is this good or is this bad? The answer is, it is bad. Because at some point, the rate of growth in expenses will exceed the rate of growth in revenues. And we'll look at the different segments in 3M. Which business group went down year over year? The answer is personal safety, electronics, and medical solutions. All of these segments thrived during the pandemic, the height of the pandemic last year. The height of the panic, I should say. And now, of course, realistically speaking, these margins and sales will go down. But in every other segment of the business, net sales went higher year over year, yet the margins went down. What does that say? We have an inflation problem. To counter this inflation problem, here it is, you guessed it, industrial giant 3M to hike prices as inflation logistics woes bite. Here we have another one. Are you paying attention, Mr. Powell, or not? Of course you're not paying attention. You're jerking off right now. We have a massive problem with inflation. It is spiraling out of control. These price hikes will be reflected in higher prices to us, the consumer. You think 3M at some point is going to say, you know what? We hiked prices higher. Our margins improved. And the consumer did not respond negatively to the price hikes. You think they're going to take these price hikes away because inflation is quote-unquote transitory? Of course not. These price hikes are permanent, specifically when it comes as a remedy to counter wage inflation. Next, we have Visa. And after hours, the name is down. Last time I checked, about 3% or so. So what went wrong here? When we look at the income statement, the net revenues were up 29% year over year. And the net income was up a stunning. 68% year over year. The payments volume was down significantly from last quarter. It was still up 17% year over year, but last quarter, this number exceeded over 30% year over year. It is not a major problem though. The business is thriving and it continues to command massive pricing power. The year-over-year -year increase in revenues was 29%. On the other hand, the expenses were higher by 15% year-over-year, and we'll continue to watch marketing spending, because that continues to go higher and higher and higher. This time around, it was 58% year-over-year. But when your revenues are growing at a faster and higher pace than your expenses, the business is fine. The operating income at 37% year over year and the net income at a stunning 68% year over year. So what went wrong here? In the earnings call, the management exposed the problem with the Chinese market, the cross-border volume. This is scary, folks, because we, it appears that we have a massive problem with the Chinese consumer. We have a massive slowdown in the economy in China, and I believe that the stock went down in empathy with this news. The stock market has the tendency to look forward. This is a lagging indicator, earnings from last quarter. When the management says, guess what, we have a massive slowdown in China, the shares are not going to be excited when they look forward and they see that these numbers are not going to be replicated in the next quarter, and therefore the stock is reacting negatively. This is yet another important indicator to the weakness in the Chinese economy. What are we going to get tomorrow? We're going to get Boeing, we're going to get GM. All of these earnings will provide a confirmation or a negation whether we're having a massive slowdown in the Chinese consumer and the Chinese economy as a whole. Why is this important, by the way? Because we have another, perhaps the most important earnings right after Facebook, Apple. If we have a massive slow down in consumption in China, then Apple's earnings will be impacted negatively. And Apple is the most important name in the market. It has the biggest weighting by far. If Apple goes down, the entire market will go down with it. Next, we have another giant, Microsoft. What's going on here? Last time around, we looked at LinkedIn and the Azure business. The rate of growth in LinkedIn was 42% year over year. And for LinkedIn marketing solutions, the rate of growth was a stunning 91% year over year. And I told you that this is not sustainable, of course. And the reason is spending went higher on LinkedIn due to the reopening and the optimism that we're going to go back to work at the office soon enough. This did not happen, of course, due to the rise of Delta, and therefore, spending in the last quarter was down. The rate of growth was down in LinkedIn. But the crown jewel in Microsoft remains the Azure business. Last time around, the rate of growth was 45% year over year. So what are the numbers that we got this time around? And by the way, before we move on, notice the currency impact. When the dollar goes down, this is not good for companies like Microsoft and Apple, but specifically Microsoft. Last quarter... 
the Dixie rallied higher, and therefore the margins are supposed to be improving. Here's what we got. The rate of growth in LinkedIn went down to 39%, and the rate of growth for LinkedIn marketing solutions went down to 59% year over year. On the other hand, the rate of growth in the Azure business continues to climb higher. This time around, we have 48% year over year. This was, of course, the thesis behind my investment in Microsoft. I was looking for the highest rate of growth in the cloud business, and Azure is defeating everybody, Alibaba, AWS, Google, Apple, everybody. The problem is this time around the earnings report is a mixed bag. The company continues to grow in the Azure and cloud in Microsoft Dynamics, but the rate of growth in other segments is slowing down. This is a problem when you have a stock that is already up almost 40% year to date, and the ratios, the price to earnings, the forward PE, the price to sales, the peg ratios, are extremely elevated. This is the most expensive name in the FANG names, in the big cap technology names. Microsoft is more expensive than Apple, certainly more expensive than Google and Facebook. So for me, I decided to dump all my shares in the after hours. I'm done here. I achieved my goal from this investment. Greed is not good. I'm being in love with a stock is not good. Because guess what? The stock doesn't love you back. You have a goal. You enter the trade and the investment with a goal. You scored about 40% year to date in gains. Isn't this enough? For me, it is. Next, we have Alphabet aka Google. What's going on here? This is the report, the report before the one we got today. The rate of growth in revenues was 62% year over year. The operating margins were 31% year over year. And the net income was a stunning 266 growth year over year. How does the most recent report stand against this report? Here's the answer. The increase in revenue year over year was 41%, still good, but slowing down. The operating margins were around the same number, 32%, and then we have the net income up about 68% year over year. What does that say? The business is still growing. This is still a good company, commanding a significant power. The problem is the rate of growth is slowing down. The opportunity of buying this stock already came and went away. You should have bought this stock at the beginning of the year. For now, this is the opportunity to take profits and move away to another name, perhaps another growing name, another opportunity, another safety trade, another safety bet to hedge against the upcoming taper and tightening in the monetary policy. The crown jewel for Alphabet remains YouTube. And these are the numbers from the last report, not the report that we got today, but the one before that. YouTube ads were up 84% year over year. What is the rate of growth this time around for the September quarter? It is 43% year over year, and quarter over quarter it is only 3%. What does that mean? It means that the rate of growth is slowing down. Once again, the opportunity of buying this stock was at the beginning of the year. When everybody was busy with Apple, Microsoft, Tesla, no love for Google at all. But right now, the ship already sailed. The growth is already stagnating. And therefore, the shares are not reacting negatively or positively after hours. They're pretty much trading flat slightly to the negative side. And by the way, what about the new phone, the Pixel 6? Everybody was excited about this phone, but according to the reviews, I watched some of them, it is not impressive. There's nothing special about this phone. Yes, the camera is good, but it is still second to the iPhone. The iPhone remains the king of cameras. So what is the point here of buying this phone? Maybe the pricing is a little more attractive than a Samsung, for example. But besides that, this phone failed to impress. And here are some bonus earnings for you. Let's start with Robinhood, the hood. What a disaster this one is. And it is important not just because it is Robinhood, because it is a pulse to the sentiment in the market and the participation of the retail side. Believe it or not, the company reported a miserable quarter. Why? Because the revenue from cryptos is actually going down. So who did buy the dip, the last dip in cryptos? Certainly not the retail crowd, it was the whales and the institutionals, or perhaps international buyers. But according to Robinhood, the business is down. The majority of the revenues right now are coming from options trading. And guess what's going to happen soon enough? The stock market will trade down after monetary tightening, and the volume in the options market will also slide down, as a lot of retail traders lose money. They're going to get caught with their pants down, and then there is no more yayo. No more tokens and stimmies to continue to gamble in the big casino. So this business is toast. It should be trading at $33 billion valuation. It should be at $10 billion maximum. But the importance of Robinhood's earnings is a pulse on the market sentiment and the participation from the retail side. 
everybody says that the mania continues to go on, and we're certainly seeing massive moves in these little meme names, meme stocks, and even large stocks like Tesla. Although I am skeptical here that the recent pop in Tesla was due to retail traders. Yet the numbers from Robinhood tell a different story, a story that the retail participation in the market is slowing down. What are the two catalysts that push this mania, this hyper bubble in the market, higher and higher and higher? Number one, the cog from the Fed. Number two, the retail mania, putting blindfolds on, running Naruto style, heads first, buying call options, thinking later. Matter of fact, don't think at all, just buy, buy. Buy. Well, if the retail participation is getting shot, and soon enough the coke will get shot, then what will keep this market higher? Earnings? Excuse me, earnings are not good, at least when pinned against the valuations in the market. And here is another bonus earnings from Twitter. We're tracking Twitter, of course, because we have a story from Facebook and Snapchat indicating that the ad revenue is slowing down. So what is going on here with Twitter? The shares are trading higher after hours, but not due to to a good report. This is an abysmal report, a disastrous report. But unlike Google and Snapchat, the stock of Twitter has been lagging the market and therefore it has a favorable valuation. So even a disappointing number, a disappointing print is actually sending Twitter shares higher because we have a lot of shorts who shorted Twitter ahead of time anticipating a disaster looking at the numbers from Snapchat and Facebook. The disaster is here Yet the shares are reacting positively. And the reason is the stock is already beating down, beaten down, excuse me. And here are the numbers from Twitter. The revenues were up 37% year over year. The problem is the costs and expenses were up 230% year over year. Is it a surprise that the net income was actually down year over year? A stunning loss of over half a billion dollars. This is not a good report, folks. This is a disastrous report. The company continues to lose money this is not investable at all you're gonna see pops short covering etc but all in all this is not an investable stock you cannot be at this stage when every other business benefited from the pandemic be it snapchat tiktok youtube facebook instagram how come twitter didn't benefit from the pandemic there's a problem here and the problem is the lack of ability to monetize the platform on top of that we have uh, jack dorsey who is busy with cryptos and square he's not paying attention to twitter we need a new ceo somebody who's going to turn this platform platform around and figure out how to monetize the platform. And here is the bottom line, folks. Margins are shrinking across the board. Companies are responding by raising prices higher to us, the end customer, meaning that inflation is going to go higher and higher and higher. Are you prepared as a consumer to face this upcoming inflation? It's already here. It's going to get worse. Are you prepared financially? Number two, as a market participant, are you prepared to reallocate your assets from weaker companies with no pricing advantage to stronger companies with intact growth and a pricing power. And this is the message of the day. Now let's move on to the market's coverage, starting with the performance. And here we go. The Dow Industrial Average was up 15.73 points or a gain of 0.04%. The Nasdaq was up almost 9 points or a gain of 0.06%. And the S&P 500 was up 8.31 points, or a gain of 0.18%. What about the sector's performance today? Leading the pack at number one and capturing the gold medal, healthcare remains the safest sector of the market right now, along with consumer defensives, by the way. But here we go at number two, utilities, capturing the silver medal, and number three for the bronze, consumer defensives. Meanwhile, the laggards are led by industrials, consumer cyclicals, and communication services. The awful performance of industrials is due to the performance of defense companies. Lockheed Martin down over 10% today, Raytheon down, Northrop down, everything is down. We will discuss the performance of defense stocks in the heat map analysis. But before we do that, here is the advance to decline ratio for the NYSE 43% advancing versus 55% declining. For the NASDAQ 43% advancing versus 54% declining. This is the first negative ratio in a few days indicating that perhaps we are starting a reversal in the market across the board, NYSE and the NASDAQ. Moving on to futures, what's going on here? Let's start with crude oil prices up about 1% for the WTI, about half a percentage point for the Brent. Crude oil prices continue to move higher and higher and higher. This is the later stage of this inflation crisis, by the way. This is a similar behavior of the 2007-2008 performance, when inflation started to get out of whack, pushing energy prices higher and higher and higher, 
And soon enough, the entire bubble blew up. There is a major debate, by the way, whether this inflation is going to be persistent and prolonged like the 70s, or is it going to be fast and quick like the 2007-2008 model. If it is indeed similar to the 2008 case, then energy prices will indeed reach 100 bucks a barrel, if not more, in the crude oil prices, the WTI. Natural gas prices will explode out of whack, and fertilizer prices, in reaction of course, will also surge out of whack. And therefore, the last stage of inflation, you can go back to 2008-2009. The best performing sectors of the market were actually energy, financials, and materials, specifically fertilizer stocks. Nat gas prices are taking a break today of about 2% or so. But the massive rally in natural gas will continue to go on and on and on. But what about softs? We have a massive rally here in lumber prices up over 10% today alone. Transitory, huh, Mr. Pal? And then we have more gains for coffee, sugar, and cotton futures. On the other hand, we have losses led by OJ and cocoa. What about metals? The dollar appears to be bottoming for now, heading higher again. And therefore, metals prices are not reacting positively. Gold down, silver down, platinum down, copper down, palladium down. Everybody's down today. This is, of course, a leading indicator that perhaps the dollar is going to start to pop higher. What about meats? Watch out for meats prices, specifically live and feeder cattle futures. They're going to start to surge higher now. We have gains of over 1.5% for live cattle futures and a little over 1% for feeder cattle futures. On the other hand, lean hogs, not performing anymore down about two percent or so today what about grains we have gains for oats and canola along with corn futures the insane rally in oats continues to go on and on and on this is yet another alarming major signal that inflation is not going away it is not just the reckless monetary policy by the way but we have the climate crisis impacting crops across the board but specifically oats the lowest crop since the 1800 are you surprised to see oats prices surging out of whack? Then we have losses for wheat, rough rice, and soybean oil futures. On the other hand, soybeans and soybean meal futures were trading at the flat line. And by the way, before we move on, look at the Bloomberg Commodities Index reaching all-time highs. Here we go. Here we go. Moving on to the big casino, the options market, what's going on here? The hottest table by far, number one, Tesla, the souffle, with about 2 million contracts, about 63% of those were calls. And here it is at number two, Facebook. With about 900,000 contracts exchanging hands today, about 62% of those were calls. The number three, AMD. With about 800,000 contracts, about 73% of those were calls. Where is Apple, by the way? Everybody's waiting and waiting and waiting. No bets before earnings. And the wheel keeps spinning. And before we move on to the unusual activities, by the way, let's go and answer this question. The viewer says, been meaning to ask, why do we care about these, meaning the unusual activities in the options market? Are they right? Are they wrong? Do you ever go back to see how these unusual size lots played out? We track some of those, of course, but the importance of watching the options market is three points. Point number one, spotting legitimate unusual activities, meaning insider information and insider trading. This happens all the time by corporate insiders, by people who get information ahead of time. This is standard procedure, by the way. It happens all the time in the options market, and we spotted a lot of those in previous videos. Point number two is the herd mentality. Just look at what happened with Tesla, for example. It wasn't due to the news from Hertz. It was fake news to begin with, but it was due to legitimate herd mentality of a stampede producing a gamma squeeze you cannot fight the herd at some point you're gonna have to join them how do you know what's going on you watch the unusual activities in the options market and you will find out where the herd is going you can bet with them you can also bet against them watching the options volume watching the implied volatility so tracking these trades the unusual activities gives us a wealth of knowledge about the herd mentality how to bet with them and how to bet against them. For example, the deal with Hertz was only about $4 billion, yet it managed to produce over $120 billion in market value. This is a lot of money that was made in a single day. So point number one, spotting legitimate insider activities. Number two, spotting the herd mentality. And point number three, spotting market manipulation. It happens all the time. I will give you an example. A firm I used to work for, 
We had sophisticated programs. We look at the implied volatility. We look at the allocation for market makers in a certain stock. Combining this information, you can find out where the gamma squeeze could happen. You can find out the potential for gamma squeeze. And at some point, you find a high certainty trade. And what we do is we buy a significant amount of call options, forcing the market maker, knowing the allocation ahead of time, that they will need to neutralize the delta by buying the underlying stock in massive quantities, leading to the trade to become profitable quickly. And this happens all the time, by the way. This is standard procedure in this industry. Market manipulation happens all the time. And if you have the experience and the knowledge to spot certain trades, certain unusual activities, this gives us unique insights and we can use these insights to conduct trades. Sometimes we follow the herd, sometimes we bet against the herd, but tracking the unusual activities is extremely important. And speaking of, here it is, let's move on to the unusual activities that took place in the options market today. Starting with the ticker TSLA Tesla. They're buying puts here with the expiration date this Friday, October 29th. They're buying the 950 with expectations that Tesla could go down by more than 7% by then. They paid about five bucks a piece to enter this trade. All in all, spending about twelve and a half million dollars. What about the trade for the ticker K Web, K W E B, the Chinese technology ETF? Everybody's assuming that we have a bottom in Chinese names, Alibaba. Pindudu, JD, or what if this, just another catch a falling knife kind of thing. There is no guarantee whatsoever that we have a bottom in Chinese names, and somebody's betting for the resumption of the pain in Chinese technology stocks. They bought the 46 and a half puts for the expiration date, November 19th, with expectations that the name could go down by more than 7% by then. They paid about one buck a piece to enter this trade, all in all, spending about two and a half million dollars what about the trade for the ticker nvda nvidia why is nvidia surging higher today we have a massive gamma squeeze they bought a lot of call options rapidly and my theory is we have on thursday the big revelation from facebook the metaverse and the name change well facebook has a lot of problems but another way to bet on the metaverse is buying nvidia who's going to provide all the chips for the metaverse to work if you want to avoid Facebook, you go with NVIDIA, and therefore they're buying calls here, specifically the 260 calls for the expiration date, October 29th, meaning this upcoming Friday, with expectations that NVIDIA could pop higher by more than 5% by then. They paid about one buck a piece to enter this trade, all in all spending about two and a half million dollars. And what about the trade for the ticker SPY for the S&P 500? They're buying protection here, the 430 puts, the expiration date, November 29th, with expectations that the name could drop down by more than 6% by then. They paid about two bucks a piece to enter this trade. All in all, spending about $3.6 million. Continuing with interesting trades, what about the trade for the ticker MPC for Marathon Petroleum? They're buying calls aggressively here. These 72 and a half calls for the expiration date, December 17th. With expectations that the name could pop higher by more than 6% by then, they paid about one buck and 70 cents a piece to enter this trade. All in all, spending about $1.8 million. And what about the trade for the ticker DAL or Delta? Not the virus, the airlines. They're buying calls here, specifically the 42 calls for the expiration date, November 12th, with expectations that the name could pop higher by more than 6% by then. They paid about 42 cents a piece to enter this trade, all in all, spending about $375,000. And here it is, the ticker TWTR, Twitter. Somebody bet right, at least for now. They bought the 73 calls for the expiration date, November 5th, with expectations that Twitter could pop higher by more than 19% by then. And they paid about 65 cents a piece to enter this trade. All in all, spending about $600,000. And what about the trade for the ticker BKKT? We talked about this name. It popped higher, significantly higher last night, or yesterday, excuse me, due to the news of the collaboration with MasterCard in providing cryptos. But the name was down big today. The squeeze is over and somebody's betting for more pain to come by buying the 20 puts for the expiration date, November 19th, with expectations that the name could drop down by more than 16% or more by then they paid about four bucks and 20 cents a piece to enter this trade all in all spending about three and a half million dollars lastly what about the trade for the ticker xbi for the biotech etf they continue to buy calls here specifically the 135 calls for the expiration date january 21st of next year of course we're not going to go back to the future 
with expectations that the name could pop higher by more than 9% by then, and they paid about 3 bucks a piece to enter this trade, all in all, spending about $2.4 million. Moving on to the heat map analysis, what's going on here? When we look at the heat map, What's working? Certain names in reaction to earnings, for example, UPS, GE, we talked about in the video already, but we have massive underperformance from tech, even the inflationary trade of industrials, financials, metals, not performing at all, even energy not performing, with the exception of Exxon. What is performing in the market today? The answer is healthcare. And I told you healthcare will be the safest sector in the market for now, in addition to consumer staples and the consumer defensives. They already reported earnings, by the way. Procter & Gamble, Kimberly Clark, Unilever, and tomorrow we're going to have Coca-Cola. These names enjoy massive pricing power. And pay attention now. The name of the game will change in the market as this inflation crisis gets worse. Perhaps we are at the later episodes of this market mania, meaning the likelihood of tech and growth to continue to work is not likely. The likelihood of the inflation trade to continue to work out is going to be limited. We're talking about financials, energy, industrials, and materials. But what is guaranteed to work, at least for now, the last resort, are companies with massive pricing power who already reported earnings. So we don't have to worry about earnings anymore. We're talking about Procter & Gamble, Unilever, Kimberly Clark, and many other names to come. Take, for example, the move in Eli Lilly today. Eli Lilly is seeking to sell its own Alzheimer drug, beginning the process for seeking the FDA's approval of that treatment for early stage disease based on results from a mid stage study. Now, there's always a risk here when you have names popping higher due to a single drug. If the trials don't work out or the FDA stops the approval, then there is a risk. And therefore, I go with ETFs. We talk about the healthcare market or the healthcare sector, excuse me. We have ETFs like the XLV, for example. And that way, you're not relying on one name if it moves higher or down. And here are notable movers today. The ticker DKNG, DraftKings, was trading higher about 4% today in reaction to this news. DraftKings passes Passes on, meaning goodbye, we're not interested anymore. The $22.4 billion buyout of a UK gambling powerhouse in Tain. DraftKings is a small company to begin with. Spending over $22 billion on a single acquisition is not good at all. These are the same mistakes that certain companies made during the 1990s bubble. They continued to overpay, believing that the mania will go on and on and on to infinity and beyond. And therefore, they don't have to worry about overpaying for companies. We all know how that movie ended, and therefore, DraftKings dodged a bullet here, a massive one. And obviously, we have the Chinese names, the likes of Alibaba, was down big today, over 3.5%. Likewise, JD down over 3%, Pindudu over 7% to the downside. We also have the high beta names. The social media names were also down, chiefly Pinterest, another day in more pain, losses of over 5.5%. But the big dog, Facebook, is also down almost 4% today. And the likelihood is we will see more pain for Facebook to come. They're ganging up against Facebook, by the way. Mark Zuckiniberg is right. There is a conspiracy here to destroy Facebook, and specifically Mark. They want the Zuck out at any cost. And this is a war, by the way, between they, quote-unquote they, and Mark Zuckiniberg. He's going to fight back on Thursday by distracting, by changing the company's name, and shifting the focus to VR and Metaverse. Will it work? Perhaps it will, resulting in a pop on Thursday. This could be tradable, of course or an opportunity if you're holding it back to get the hell out because they're going to continue to hammer Facebook over and over and over again. We have more leaks to come. But we're having more and more criticism against Facebook that it allowed vaccine misinformation to go on and on and on in the platform. They want Facebook to police the information and provide information just from so-called verified sources. This is a massive problem, folks. A war between Facebook and they. And I don't want to be involved in this war. There's no point at all, even though Facebook's valuations remain attractive but as you will see from the charts analysis the chart doesn't look good at all what else we also have cruises underperforming carnival cruises royal caribbean all underperforming today and the reason is we have more cdc guidelines extending the health rules for cruise ships all the way till mid-january 
We also have a name like Xping down big, underperforming the EV market today, even though we have good news from Xping. Apparently, Chinese EV maker Xping wants to make flying cars a reality. Now, if Tesla announced this, the culties will pile on the flying cars, bro. We're going to push the premium to 10 trillion. But no love for Xping when it does the same. We also have underperformance from the crowd favorite names, the high beta names, the likes of Build.com, the ticker B-I-L-L, Affirm, Shopify, Didi, Zendesk, all of these names underperform the market today. Likewise, we have massive underperformance in industrials. Leading the entire sector to lag the market today is the abysmal performance of defense stocks. Lockheed Martin is down big, over 10%. Likewise, we have Northrop is down, Raytheon is down. We have major bad news from Raytheon, by the way. Here it is. Raytheon will lose several thousand workers due to COVID-19 vaccine mandate. This is a massive number, folks. Thousands of workers. This is just one company. We already have a massive labor problem. These mandates are an economic disaster. When you have a company like Raytheon, an important national security company, a defense company that is about to lose thousands of workers, Perhaps workers with sensitive information, national security sensitive information. They're going to get fired because they refuse to get the jab. This is a massive economic story, not just a public health story. And I believe if the pressure continues, the Biden administration will have no other choice but to forego these jab mandates. Perhaps companies will forego the jab mandates or delay them over and over and over and over. We have cops quitting, teachers quitting, firefighters quitting, nurses quitting. And now we have employees with important national security data also quitting due to the jab mandates. Absolute mayhem. Moving on to charts, starting with the 30 minutes chart of the SPY. What's going on here? The chart continues to defy gravity and all patterns, but perhaps it is running out of luck. The volume is creeping back in the market on the downside, on the selling side. We also have earnings. We got very important earnings today. They're not bad. They're not awful. They're not great. They're not terrible either. They're about meh. That's how I feel about these earnings. They're okay for now, but it is abundantly clear that the theme here is we have a massive slowdown in growth and momentum. We have inflation eating away margins, and companies are jacking up prices higher and higher and higher, meaning that the honeymoon period of this rally, of this bull market, is over. And now we're just bargaining with each other that it is not over. Even though it is over, the riding is on the wall. The retail participation is going down, and the coke from the Fed is also slowing down. It's about to be tapered, if not removed altogether. When we look at the chart here from a candlestick pattern, what's going on? We have what it appears to be a bear flag formation that is already breaking down. We have the support of 454. We have a gap before that. Let's see how the chart reacts. If it does hold support, then the best case scenario for the bulls is consolidation for a little while and then the resumption of the move higher. But the likely scenario is the aftermath of the algorithmic rally, the low volume rally, gapping higher every day. The aftermath of this rally will be a massive flush down, closing some of these gaps. This will happen when the human being decides to sell. For now, we're digesting the earnings. Again, they're not bad. But they're not great either. So what will the market do after digesting all of these earnings? And here is the daily chart for the continuous contract on the SPY. We are now at almost 10 green candles. I've never seen anything like this before. Green candle after green candle after green candle, leading the momentum indicators to become overextended and elevated readings, meaning a sell zone, a profit-taking zone. The SPY will not be able to force its way higher against all the odds. The technicals are overextended. The forces of gravity will show up when the human being reacts to the earnings that we got today. The support in this case will be 4,549 and a half. And in all likelihood, this will not hold either. Moving on to the cues. What's going on here in the NASDAQ? 30 minutes chart. Trading in ladder land. We had a bear flag on Friday. The bear flag was canceled right away due to the pop in Tesla on Monday. Now we have another bear flag. What will cancel this bear flag? Will it be a positive reaction to Alphabet, for example? Will it be a positive reaction to Microsoft's earnings? You need both. 
to push the market higher. But if both go down because the market is thinking what I'm thinking, meh, they're trading pretty much at all-time highs. Not impressed here. I'm taking profits. If other market participants are thinking the same way, then both Alphabet and Microsoft will open down tomorrow. And these are two behemoths, two giants. If they go down, they will take all the indices down with them. And here is a daily chart for the continuous contract of the NASDAQ. Again, it appears that we have a topping formation, a shooting star. We need a confirmation. The confirmation could happen overnight after all this is the futures contract even though the momentum indicators remain positive but if this is indeed a shooting star we're about to have a confirmation and the next support with will be, will be 15,192 and after that 15,000 and the sell-off could happen rapidly we're taking the escalator higher and the elevator down moving on to the IWM the IWM popped higher in the morning this is the Rus the Russell 2000 of course the 30 minutes chart it popped higher in the morning beating the resistance of 229 yet the pop didn't last for long we have this rotational nature in the market the nasdaq opened weaker the iwm opened higher and then we saw the opposite the nasdaq rebounded higher and the iwm reacted to the downside breaking the support of 229 bringing it back into resistance what happens now we have a bear flag and the likelihood is it will play down specifically of the human being comes out of hibernation and they decide to sell because the selling is indiscriminate. On the other hand, the algos have the rotational mentality. They pop the Russell 2000 one day and then they dump and they pump the Qs instead, the Nasdaq. Back and forth, back and forth. Lather, rinse, repeat. And what about the dollar, by the way, the Dixie? It did break the support of 93.7, but the behavior of the chart of hugging the support line refusing to fall back was a sign of resiliency, a sign that the dollar is not ready to go down and it will reclaim the support once again. We have many central banks meeting this week producing announcements to react to inflation. The majority of these announcements will be tightening. Tightening is good for the dollar to go higher. And if the dollar is about to pop higher, this will not be good for our friend gold. Gold, what's going on here? In purgatory, not doing anything at all. Reversing the move from yesterday. And you cannot rely on gold at all until the three enemies are shot together. The dollar, the 10-year yield, and Bitcoin. Maybe Bitcoin is about to go down, but the dollar is about to pop. And the 10-year yield... It might go down for a little while before it catches support and starts to rally once again. There is no break here for gold. Forget about the inflation hedge. Not going to happen, at least not for now. Moving on to the 10-year yield, what does the chart say here? We have a trading channel, higher highs and higher lows. Who's to say the chart is not going to go down all the way to the end of the channel, the lower end of the channel, I should say. And this will be, coincidentally, of course, meeting the 1.55% support if the chart doesn't rebound from that point then we have a problem perhaps we have a top in yields for now on the other hand if the chart starts to rebound higher from the support of 1.55 or before that meaning before revisiting 155 for support then this will be a massive bullish signal for yields to pop higher and a massive alarming signal for the market specifically the nasdaq the high beta the high momentum and growth names they're not going to perform if yields continue to pop higher and the number we're eyeing here is 1.7 1.7 a close above 1.7 will rattle the market a little bit a close above 1.8 oh, we're gonna start shitting our pants and here is the chart of the tlt this is a weekly chart of course for now it is trying to work its way higher yet we have we continue to have negative divergences in both the macd and the rsi indicators for now the pattern is a bear flag pattern we have a rejection from 149 and now the chart is consolidating back and forth back and forth if it doesn't climb back to 149 soon enough meaning by the end of the week then in all likelihood this will be a bear flag it will play down all the way to 134 and a half and this will come hand in hand with a pop in the 10-year yield to 1.7 percent and beyond what about the vix four hours chart what's going on here it is working its way from extreme oversold conditions from extreme weak conditions on the macd indicator and the rsi the momentum was lost and the vix is building back the momentum right now and preparing for a massive pop higher we're eyeing friday's close the weekly close will the vix close above 20 this will be a win for the bears or will the bulls crush the vix again you know crush the vix fridays the question is how much more it is already crushed the risk versus reward says the vix is bottoming it's about to pop higher significantly so the spy is stopping for now and it is about to flush down to close some of those gaps that it made on the way higher
continue to watch the MACD indicator from a four hours perspective. Here is a daily chart for Apple. What's going on here? As I said before, the chart will continue to face the resistance at 150 and the support at 145. In all likelihood, the chart is not going to move higher or lower, by the way, until analysts will get earnings. And we are eyeing the China number specifically. For now, the chart is in purgatory before we head to earnings. The options volume is dropping down. What does that mean? Apple premiums are getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. If you have high degree of confidence that Apple will pop higher after earnings, or perhaps it will crash after earnings, then this is your opportunity to use the elevated premiums, either open a position right away buying calls or puts, or perhaps opening a calendar call or a calendar put, and this will be the wise choice, by the way. And here it is, your favorite chart, Tesla, the souffle. This is a daily chart. What's going on? Here. Last night we were looking for a spike top formation. Perhaps we're getting the spike top right now. The RSI at mania levels indicating that a pullback is imminent. The pullback is already happening. It already happened today. But in all likelihood, we will see more downside to come for Tesla, perhaps going all the way to close the gap at around 900. When we zoom in, what is the confirmation for a spike top, by the way? A bearish reversal candlestick pattern. What do we have here? We have a shooting star. This is a negative bearish formation indicating that the reversal is imminent. And this is confirmed, by the way, by the spike in volume. Yesterday, we saw the spike in volume higher. Now we're seeing the spike in volume to the downside, thus the reversal. What is the shooting star pattern, by the way? Let's read here. The shooting star is similar to the evening star. It is a bearish top reversal pattern that may appear in an uptrend and warns of a possible trend reversal. Where the shooting star differs from the evening star is in the shape of the star, which in the case of the shooting star has a long upper shadow, like a shooting star, and no or very low, little lower shadow. In other words, the star in the shooting star pattern takes the form of an inverted hammer rather than a doji or spinning top. As with the evening star, the shooting star formation consists of three candlesticks. With the middle candlestick being the star, the first candlestick must be light in color, meaning green, and must have a relatively large real body. We already have that. The second candlestick is the star with a short real body that gaps away from the real body of the first candlestick. The star may form within the upper shadow of the first candlestick. The star implies a weakness in the uptrend as the price rallied and then declined to close closer to the open price. However, the ascending gap between the first candlestick and the star has also a bullish implication. Thus, the third candlestick in the formation must confirm the pattern and must be a dark candlestick, meaning red, that closes well into the body of the first candlestick. As with the evening star, the reliability of the shooting star is enhanced when the real body of the third candlestick gaps away from the real body of the star. The reliability of the pattern is also enhanced by the extent to which the real body of the third candlestick penetrates the real body of the first candlestick. And if the volume in the first candlestick is lower than the volume in the third candlestick is higher, this doesn't make sense, of course. What it should say is the volume in the third candlestick, if it happens tomorrow, should be higher than the volume in the first candlestick. This will enhance the certainty that this is indeed a reversal pattern. Now, when we zoom in to a 30 minutes chart, for example, it doesn't get better. It gets actually worse because we have a shooting star within a shooting star. This is the Christopher Nolan pattern, and it is powerful, by the way. We have a shooting star, a top, followed by a bear flag, and the bear flag is already playing out. You combine the daily chart with a 30 minutes chart, not looking good here, but we know that Tesla has been the Teflon stock, defying gravity, defying logic, defying the technicals, so anything could happen. But the educated guess here is that this is a top and the chart will trade down from this point on. We have the reversal. It needs a confirmation, but we're close enough. And by the way, take a look at the performance, the divergence between Tesla and ARK Invest. Apparently, Mama Kathy had them uh, paper hands. She dumped Tesla. And now the performance of ARK is lagging Tesla. So Mama Kathy, Tesla witch Mama Kathy, is dumping her winners to fund her losers. A genius strategy, of course. Moving on to tulips, BTC, what's going on here? Not looking good, we have a bear flag, the momentum indicators are reversing, and we have bad news from Robinhood indicating that the crypto volume is down. So wh whoever was behind this pump is not the retail crowd. It is perhaps whales and international buyers. And in all likelihood, the chart will go down to the support of 55,300, and then we'll take it from there. What about AMC? What's 
going on here? Holding for dear life. This is a 30 minutes chart, of course, for AMC. Holding for dear life to 36 and a half. If it fails and it closes decisively below 36 and a half, the next support will be 32. And after 32, the sinkhole opens. From a daily chart perspective, we have a reversal in the MACD indicator. We were hopeful that the Positive crossing in the MACD indicator will last for a little while and perhaps produce a pop all the way to the 50s. Unfortunately for the apes, this pop is already fading away. It is failing and fading away. So this is not a good sign for the apes. What about the weekly? What's going on here on the weekly chart for AMC? Not looking good either. You see the red columns on the MACD getting longer and longer and longer. If we had a failure to cross. This is an ominous signal in any chart, not just AMC. In all likelihood, we will see the flush down and the end of the mania in AMC pretty soon. There are a lot of distractions from Dwack to Tesla to cryptos, to other garbage stocks, and the apes are getting distracted here. And lastly, here is the daily chart from Facebook. It already broke the trend, by the way. I don't use moving averages, but here is the 200 days moving average. In any chart, breaking the 200 days moving average is an ominous signal. However, in typical behavior, when the 200 days is broken, the chart attempts, keyword attempts, to climb back the 200 days moving average. We have a catalyst, for a pop, perhaps closing the gap, an opportunity to recapture the trend line once again. This opportunity is the metaverse announcement, the name change, and Thursday. But in all likelihood, whatever pop we're going to have from Facebook is not going to last because breaking the 200 days moving average on a higher than average volume is an ominous signal, a confirmation that the upward trend in this stock is over. We're about to start a bearish trend in the stock. Mind you, this is a value name in technology. If this name is trading down, then forget about the overvalued names in Microsoft, Apple, and Google. Moving on to the conclusion of this video, starting with the earnings calendar. What do we have tomorrow? We have Boeing in the morning, along with Coca-Cola and McDonald's. And after the bill, we have General Motors and Ford. And by the way, this is typical behavior of distracting from upcoming disastrous earnings. General Motors released some news today. They will start making Chevy Bolts again in November 1st. Okay. They're also adding 40,000 electric vehicle charging stations in the US and Canada. This is the kind of news that you get from the earnings report. So why are they releasing good news ahead of time? Anything to hide here, GM? And again, I'm not short. I'm not bearish GM at all. I'm long forward, but I do believe that we will see a massive haircut here because the numbers will be abysmal. Combine the chip shortage with the weakness in China, and you have the perfect storm for these stocks to go down. Lastly, what do we have on the economic calendar? What's going on here? We have durable goods and we have factory orders. These are the two important numbers that we're going to get tomorrow. However, all in all, the most important thing to watch tomorrow is how the market will react after digesting the earnings from two giants. Alphabet and Microsoft. If these two names go down and the market is not impressed, we will see a reversal in the market overall. Anyhow, folks, this is all I got for you for now. I'm beat up. My voice is gone. You try to do this for over an hour every day. I need Ricola. But anyhow, thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. And I will talk to you again tomorrow. If you found the information presented in this video helpful, please subscribe, press the like button, the notification button, and follow me on social media.